Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So in keeping with the All Things LGBTQ plus tradition, we have invited to join us for this interview show, one of the new out LGBTQ plus representatives. And this is the representative from the Bennington Rutland district. And I'm gonna look so I include all the correct towns representing Danby, Dorset, Landgrove, Mount Tabor, and Peru. So please welcome for a first time visit with all things, Representative Mike Rice. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Keith. Good to be with you. It's, it's nice having you here. And thank you for, for finding time, because I know right now you're in the second half of this, of this year's session. There's a real push to get bills through. So let's start by talking a little bit about you and how a, a charming young man from upstate New York ends up in Vermont. Yeah, um, well, I'm down here in the Southwest corner of Vermont, the Southwest Queendom, we like to call it. Um, and uh, so not too far actually from where I grew up outside of Albany. Um, but I did, you know, my partner and I, um, first landed in Vermont up in Barnard. Um, and I had, uh, gone there to, to work a season, uh, on a farm, uh, and cider making project. Um, so we moved into a little cabin, uh, that came along with the, the apprentice job that I had. And, um, I was spending the time, you know, gathering apples and helping, uh, to press cider, learn how to make uh, cider and, and vinegar and helping to get the farm property ready for the winter. It was, you know, the, the fall and into the early winter that we were there. Um, and that season ended and that job ended and our tenure in that little cabin ended, but we both sort of looked at each other and said, we've got to figure out a way to stay in Vermont. We just love it here. So it took a little while as, as uh, I think, is common for two of us to find jobs, you know, somewhat related to our fields or the fields we wanted to be in and to find uh, housing. Um, and the combination of those things uh, and landed us down here um, in, uh, in at the top of Bennington County. Uh, and, so, and, you know, first we're uh, renting a place uh, for a couple of years and really got to know the community that way. And then uh, just before COVID, we're fortunate enough to be able to to uh, sneak in and 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 buy our 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 place here in Dorset, um, where we where we live now, and where I was able to uh, to start this journey from. I was going to say housing seems to be the you know universal. It's either what allowed the transition to happen is what inhibited it. You know, it's, we're still looking. And if you know something, could you please share that information? In that process though, you also went to the Vermont Law School. And- Yeah, so, yeah, so I finished up on the farm and then uh, knew that I wanted to stay in, engaged in food and, and, and ag work, but I also had this, you know, sort of long held interest in the policy side of things. And so when we were in Barnard, I met a, a, a bunch of Vermont law students, both law students and master's students, and got to know the programs there a little bit. And it just um, turned out to be the perfect program for me because it was this food and agriculture specific policy master's program that I ended up doing. So I got to really dig in on the on the law and policy specific to food systems and 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 the way we farm and the way we use the land. So it's exciting. So when you're not at the legislature, what what is it that you do to support yourself? So for the last few years, I've worked for a uh, farming nonprofit advocacy group, NOFA, Northeast Organic Farming Association, has uh, 
a presence in seven northeastern states. So I actually tend to work uh, not for the Vermont, not for no Vermont, but for uh, the Massachusetts chapter. Um, sort of by happenstance, uh, started working remotely for them even before COVID, and have continued to to do so. Um, for the first uh, year or so that we lived down here, I was working on a dairy farm and creamery. Um, so got a little taste of that, uh, that very specifically Vermont part of the farming world too. Not, nothing, nothing takes you further than that experiential sort of hands-on, I really know what this is like. So if you were work, have been working for NOFA, then you've been involved in sort of policy development and looking at what is our governmental institutional responses to the agricultural industry. Is that what led you into a more formal political role? Well, you know, I knew that I uh, wanted to work on uh, on some policy stuff. I had had the opportunity to work on the farming policy a little bit through NOFA. My role there is um, both development, so doing, you know, finding the money to support lots of the great programmatic work uh, that the organization does, and then also sitting on the interstate policy council, so sort of developing the broader um, policy goals of the whole Northeastern um, organic farming uh, collection of organizations. Um, but, you know, specifically, and so I wanted, I knew I wanted to work on policy and living down here in this corner of Vermont, um, you know, one path to being able to do that is is to decide to jump in and, and run to represent your community and and be able to sort of bring the, what you see, what I'm seeing on the ground down here up to Montpelier, uh, which sometimes feels like a a, a different world entirely from, from this, this corner of Vermont. Um, and, but there, you know, it sort of went beyond my interest in farm policy specifically too, and just seeing what the makeup of the legislature was, um, and and really feeling passionately about uh, the the fact that I thought there should be more younger voices, uh, you know, just just voices that weren't necessarily uh, it didn't look like they were represented quite as much as as I thought they could be um, in in the legislature, and I I decided that if I was going to think that and complain about it. I might as well try to do something about it too. So when you were running for office, did you have an idea of the types of legislation that you wanted to help introduce, support, see passage, you know, your your legislative priorities? Yeah, I mean, my I would say my legislative priorities were really uh, dictated by the conversations I was having here. Uh, you know, I knocked on a lot of doors I'm relatively new to my community uh, as far as 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 far as uh, expectations of Vermonters tend to go <laughs> for how much time you or your uh, family might have spent in a place. And so I I really committed to knocking on as many doors as I could in all five of the towns that I was hoping to represent and really having conversations and hearing uh, what was on people's minds, what people thought we needed to be doing better. And it almost always came back to these sort of intersecting crises of housing and childcare and workforce and climate, right? And how they all inter interconnect and, and they're all related and we're not gonna solve any of them without trying to attack all of them from all the different angles. So when I started thinking about what legislative priorities might be based on those conversations, it came down to things like, you know, investing in, in housing on all levels, uh, investing in childcare so that, uh, you know, parents can afford to go back into the workforce, um, uh, investing uh, in paid family and medical leave so that, uh, you know, folks can afford to take the time they need to take uh, when they're ill or when a loved one is ill um, or when they're welcoming a child and, and know that they can go back to work and their employer can know that they're coming back to work too. All those things started to really sort of rise to the top. Now, following... Representative Kate Donnelly's resignation, you know, I, I have been asking our out legislators and, you know, you've talked about going door to door and, and meeting the people in your district. You were supported by the Victory Fund, so you were an out candidate. What was the community, what was your constituents response to you? And 
what has that been like now that you're serving? Yeah, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing a lot about social media and it's not necessarily all that pleasant. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say my, the response in my community um, has has overwhelmingly been positive, you know, and I was very open about who I was as I was running. I I talked often about my, you know, how my partner and I had had come to to wind up here and what he does for work in the community and and all of that. Um, you know, I'll say that it was something to navigate, you know, mentally for me as a candidate at, in, you know, in a place, in a rural place, you know, five uh, small towns spread out over mountains and valleys where, you know, everybody said that the thing that I had to do, the thing that was most important was knock on doors and drive down those long driveways where you can't see the house from the road and all of that. And I I committed to doing it and I did it and I'm glad I did. And I had a lot of really great interactions through doing it, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that sort of my, uh, my identity was not um, something I considered as I, as I was doing that. And as I was sort of making that turn to see what was at the top of the driveway or knocking on the door um, where I didn't know who was inside or hadn't met the folks who were there. It's an interesting thing to navigate too. I think as somebody who sort of holds um, marginalized identities and obviously, you know, not marginalized identities, you know, as a, as a white man who is gay, you know, sort of trying to deal with all these, this in, in a rural part of the state. Um, I think it's, it's perhaps a lot easier for me than it would be for uh, other folks, uh, but also, you know, definitely not something to be ignored either. So in the legislature, you were serving on the Agriculture, Food Resiliency, and Forestry Committee. So what is the work that you are doing in that committee that the people who are watching this interview should know about and should be supporting? Yeah, so it's a really exciting committee uh, this year specifically. We got a couple of new jurisdictional charges uh, in this biennium. It used to be agriculture and forestry. They dealt primarily with, you know, things that went on on farms and things and and uh, wood uh, forest products uh, industries. We inserted food resiliency in the middle of those two things in the name of the committee. Uh, and, and that's a huge task for us to examine how we can build more resilient food systems in Vermont and in the region, uh, how we can make sure that our communities are uh, more food secure. Um, and then we also added uh, specific language about responsibilities for climate adaptation and mitigation, sort of really naming the fact that farming needs to be a part of the solution when it comes to climate change and how that can happen and all the pieces that go into that from building soil health to being responsible for pollinators. Um, uh, and then obviously the, the sort of long held water quality um, pieces uh, in, in Vermont agriculture. So those two things just, I think really sort of sparked the committee, gave us a lot of energy that, you know, also lots of new members were, I think majority new members on the committee. Uh, it grew in size. I think it used to be eight members. It's now up to 11. We have a new chair, a new vice chair. Um, so just lots of really exciting new energy and and um, lots of inspiration to really dig into this uh, new pieces of our, of our work, which we did right off the bat by taking on this universal school meals bill, um, which really touches that food resiliency um, part of our charge. So you're also one of the leadership of the Climate Solutions Caucus, but you just mentioned, you know, the, the school food program. Personal school meals, yeah. Could, could you talk a little bit about that? Because that's something that personally people have been asking me about, and if I knew what was happening with that piece of legislation. Yeah, absolutely. So. Universal school meals, uh, free breakfast and lunch, accessible to all students in Vermont, has been the reality for the last three school years. The first two years with federal funding, uh, you know, that came out of COVID, 
And then last year, the legislature approved uh, one-time funding uh, to cover this current school year. Um, and so this bill that came to our committee uh, was introduced by a couple of members of the education committee and a couple members of, of the ag committee to say, let's make this permanent. You know, we're not going back. Uh, why do we treat food uh, differently than we treat all the other things that are just built in as a part of what we know to be a successful educational experience for our kids, whether it's the textbooks or the teachers or the bus ride in, you know, um, why would we treat breakfast and lunch any differently? So the bill, um, we took a lot of time with it in our committee. We took a lot of testimony from teachers and administrators and food service directors and school nurses and parents and students and advocates. And unanimously, they said, this is an incredible program. It's made huge changes in our school communities, please make it permanent. So our, our committee passed it. And uh, then uh, the full house uh, passed it um, two weeks ago. And uh, and now it it moves on its journey, goes to the Senate. And I think we're all really hopeful that, that we're going to get this done. If, if I'm hungry, I can't learn. And if the stigmatization of I'm the one kid in the line getting the free lunch keeps me from being in the line. You know, how, right. how have we supported our youth? That's right. And one, you know, one thing that we heard a lot about was how big the the sort of missing middle is in this. You know, there are kids whose families qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, and then there are perhaps uh, you know, a, a small percentage of the top kids who it's no problem affording, you know, food. And there's a huge uh section of kids, you know, over a third of the kids in Vermont, whose families are in that middle income bracket where they're not necessarily qualifying for the previous free and reduced lunch programs. But it is sometimes a struggle to to put enough food on the table for the family, uh, you know, for three meals a day, seven days a week, all year round. So if we can just take this piece out and say, you're not going to have to worry about your kid eating breakfast and lunch during the school day, it just makes it that much easier and that much more possible for those families to make sure everybody's fed, you know, up for for dinner and on the weekends and 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 when 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 folks aren't in school. And the committee you're serving on has the highest number of out LGBTQ legislators with three serving on the committee. So, what is it that we as members of the LGBTQ plus community can do to support you and to support the other members of the Rainbow Caucus in being our face, being our voice in the legislature and creating room for those coming up behind us? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And and one I, I might need a little more time to reflect on at, at, at just having uh, been in the building for a few months. Um, I've been really excited to see um, how broad the Rainbow Caucus is, you know, the different perspectives that are brought to the table when we gather around it, um, the different interests and, and professional backgrounds that people come to it with. You know, we have, uh, as you said, three members in our committee, one of whom is a farmer. And one of whom uh, comes to the committee through more through work in the food security and, and uh, food pantry world. Um, and then myself. And then we have, you know, Rainbow Caucus members who are, um, you know, healthcare workers and former journalists and um, nonprofit folks. And, you know, just just really runs the gamut. And so that's what's exciting to me is sort of to see all those different backgrounds and perspectives brought to the table and also have, you know, being a member of the LGBTQ community be a, be a piece of their perspective too. And we can make sure that that perspective is in every committee room uh, in, both, in, in, in both chambers. That's sort of the, uh, the real goal because it does touch everything we do in every committee. And I was going to say, and it's the members of the Rainbow Caucus that are some of those new younger members who are stepping up and coming into the political system and saying, I have a voice and I have a vision and there is change that we can work on together. 
So in our remaining time, you, you intend on running for re-election when that comes around. What, what would you like to see the legislature accomplish before the session ends? Yeah, I mean, obviously, lots of the priorities that, I, that we've already touched on. Um, and, and I'd also like to, I'd really like to see us put together a budget that speaks to all the values and priorities that that we've mentioned and some that we haven't too, you know, to to really meet the moment with with a budget that matches those values and and lets Vermonters know that we have actually heard all of what they're saying about the intersecting crises that we face and that we're going to invest so that we're not just constantly in this crisis posture. So that we're not just just continuing to sort of mire in a housing crisis uh, that leads to, you know, in part a workforce crisis, a child care crisis that's deeply connected to both of those things, a climate crisis that we've been talking about for my entire life and still haven't taken the action we need to take on it. So I think that, you know, we can do these things programmatically, but it really means a lot when we step up and put our money where our mouths are and say, if we mean it about solving these crises, about moving on, about lifting Vermonters up, we've got to do it in our budget. That's uh, that's what I'm hopeful for uh, for for this session, and uh, and then to keep to keep working, you know, in the trenches on the on the rest of the policy as well. And I understand you have ongoing forums with your constituents, so you would be continuing to hear what they have to say. So thank you for spending this time with us. And I look forward to your next visit. Thanks so much, Keith. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Krista and Eli Hawkwin Galbraith and Miko, who is whom you may hear in the background or see in person. Um, they are both involved with a project called Shapeshifters, and um, You've been, you just celebrated your ninth anniversary. So before we continue, let me welcome you. Thanks, happy to be here. Yeah. It's great to see you. Um, Eli and I met in Out in the Open Summit, how many years ago, maybe before the pandemic? It must have been. And we talked about an interview, now time has marched on and here we are happily. Um, let me tell you a little about the business, if I may, from your website. It's fashionable, self-inclusive, gender affirming clothing. Since 2014, Shapeshifters has led the way for fashionable, size-inclusive, gender affirming clothing. Uh, from its start on a shared Etsy store in the living room in Brooklyn, and that's a colorful story too that you began with. Uh, Shapeshifters has grown into its own studio in Southern Vermont, employs four people. Is that still right? Still four people? Five total. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, and has customers all over the world. We offer the largest range of skin tones available on the market, the largest size range, and the widest style oh. range. Um, let me continue about um, that your customer base. Our products are quite deliberately offered for everyone who might want to compress or flatten their chest for any reason. This includes non-binary people, trans men, trans women who want to alter their presentation or style, gender fluid people, Cis women who want to alter their presentation or style, cis men experiencing gynecomastia, anyone with a large chest who participates in physical activities in which their chest hinders their movement, and I'm sure customers who fit in none of these categories who buy and wear chest binders for their own reasons, which we all may never know. So that's a great description and a wide customer base. Um, as I said, you've just celebrated your ninth anniversary. Congratulations on that. Thank you. How did you have to start the business and has it grown steadily? 
I started the business when I came out and discovered that I couldn't find a binder that fit me and or that was fun looking <laughs> or that looked fun at all and I happen to know a little bit about sewing spandex so I made my own and uh Chris and I were living together at the time and we were in that shared Brooklyn apartment which had a shared Etsy store every roommate <laughs> in the apartment had a few products on the Etsy store and the binders sold the binders were the only things that sold <laughs> so we split them off and uh Chris had joined in helping to cut fabric and ship things and lo and behold about a year later we went viral on Tumblr that's great yeah, and um, I wouldn't. I would not say that it grew steadily. It grew in fits and spurts, yeah. and has grown much more steadily. I think since we moved to Vermont and found some lovely people to come work for us. Well, you uh, have moved all over the country or all over the Northeast in the course of your relationship. How long have you been involved? We right. met online in 2008, met in person in 2010, yeah, and started yeah. dating in 2011. And then I got married in 2014, yeah. I want to say. So gosh, that's a solid 15 years mm -hmm. since the first uh, AOL instant messenger chat room. <laughs> well, you were living, uh, Eli, in Brooklyn, and Krista was living in New Jersey. Is that right, when you first got together? Actually, when we first... Uh, met online, Eli was in Japan. <laughs> I see. That's true. That would be impressive. I see you worked as a Japanese translator for a law firm. Yeah. Very impressive. I too worked for a law firm. Oh, yeah. My, uh, and I, I started out as a proofreader, was promoted to being a paralegal, and then was fired on Wall Street. So it's, it's a year trajectory that was. And then I moved on to things that were more um, to my liking. Um, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Manhattan law. <laughs> I know, I know. And, you know, they were all about how you should dress. I mean, it was many years ago. But um, in the course of researching your interview, I learned a little about the history of binding and how draconian that in the old days, people used ace bandages and sometimes ribs were broken. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was that that far in the old days. I remember hearing about ace bandages and broken ribs and saran wrap with duct tape on top in the late '90s, early '00s. Uh, oh my! Gosh. Yeah, no, there were there were still conversations happening about it um, when we first started shapeshifters. I think it's been like really recently that the the larger conversation has been please don't do this it's very dangerous um but when we first started there was like it, half the conversation was here's the things that you can do and half the conversation was no don't do it because it's dangerous <laughs> please don't uh we started in 2014 which was the same year as gc2b and uh which is another binder company another binder company that uh also makes things in colors and stripes now before that year the binder options were white black and ugly beige and they were marketed towards cisgender men with gynecomastia and other hormonal things that might uh, grow their chests and that was it for actual chest binders uh i think tumblr really played a huge role in binder education and binding safety education because that was where a lot of these conversations happened in the mid to early to mid 20 teens actually you know what i just realized was probably a major i think was a major turning point there was a music video that came out um i believe it was lady gaga it was where she was uh binding her chest with duct tape or ace bandages or something duct tape and like the immediate reaction to this music video was no 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 this is really dangerous please don't do that somebody get in contact with her people and explain how this is really damaging <laughs> did she take it down no i don't know if the i don't know if the yeah. conversation ever reached her it was very much a you know it was in our circles but i don't think it hit mainstream well enough to to get and they, through yeah and you know she wasn't actually doing it it was just like part of a performance yeah but like that i think that really put it into the mainstream trans mask conversation yeah uh -huh. 
It's like, don't do this thing. Lady Lady Gaga had a music video with Binding with Duct Tape, and shortly thereafter, Ruby Rose did a music video Binding with Ace Bandages. Mm. Oh my and God. both of them were <laughs> provoked a lot of talk. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to pause, but on our screen, we have a another visitor who's sitting between you. Oh, you this is Remy. <laughs> Remy? Remy, R-E-M-Y. Yep. This is the cat oh. who allows the baby to pet him sometimes. Or body like that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have a family photo. Um, <laughs> but back to the subject at hand. Um, Eli, when you came out and started using binders, you said, you know, it was pretty uncomfortable. And part of the reason for you to start making your own was for physical comfort. Is that right? It was. The, the trouble that I had was that I turned out to be between sizes. A medium was too small and a large was too big. And that was it. That was all that I had uh, for options. So I took the large and I uh, took my seam ripper to it and I took it apart and I turned it inside out and I tailored it to myself. And I looked at the construction and said, you know, I can do this. Well, um, Speaking of sewing, I just saw a film called The Blue Caftan. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a Moroccan LGBTQ film about Ooh. Taylor who custom makes caftans. And um, there are so many screenshots of sewing and uh, it kind of opened my eyes to what an art sewing is. Um, so you have been sewing for a long time. You mentioned that you had a relationship with your aunt who taught you to sew. I, yeah, my, my, the whole of my mother's side of the family has been involved in fiber arts in some way or another. And one of the really delightful things about shapeshifters has been uh, getting to meet and get in touch with a whole lot of different queer tailors and the the small but growing queer tailoring community of people who are altering clothes in ways to make it easier to express ourselves. And you're an online business, right? Yes. So it's got to be a challenge when people send in their measurements. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had a lot of, of hiccups, especially uh, part of the reason that we uh, got our own website was because we needed a way to kind of force people to put it to first of all put in their measurements at all um and second of all keep them within a range that makes sense for a human being <laughs> we had a lot of trouble in the early days of people uh mixing up their inches and their centimeters or uh, measuring from the wrong side of the measuring tape so we'd end up with somebody <laughs> claiming they had a torso that was like 12 inches <laughs> in diameter or 300. <laughs> um, tell me, you're, or you emphasize community. You're not, you, you know, try not to be competitive with other industries. Uh, and I think that's a really a uh, selling point for most of us in the communities. Um, what is the average cost of a binder? For us, we start at around $80, 80 to 85 is our lower end. And we go up to typically 120, 130. Uh, for special orders, we start at 200. People who want something really special and customize themselves. If I'm making a pattern from scratch and doing something on that level, it's, uh, it's more. We, I would say that typically, you know, we're on the higher end. Uh, across the field, you will see things more in the $50 to $60 range because they are made by uh, folks who set set specific sizes and churn them out in factories mm -hmm. as opposed and, to making them to measure. And doing my research, I was able to look at some of your um, binders and they're really a work of art. And that's what reminded me of this film, The Blue Captain, because they, they're so crafted and colorful and you know they really drew with me as a potential customer in and I would imagine that's part of their wide appeal. What's the turnaround time? For most binders our turnaround time is currently four to five weeks. Mm -hmm. And you do the sewing and 
Krista does the business? Is that the way it's developed at this point? Sorry, can you say that a bit louder, please? Sure. Uh, you do the sewing, and Krista started out cutting because she could handle the scissors, and I could so much relate to that comment that you made. I used to fail crafts and camp all the time. So, but you've uh, evolved to taking care of the business operation. You designed the website, and you know you handle the on. Oh, we the actually. Presence. Sorry, um, because uh, we're we're off of like sort of really easy template websites. We uh, have hired a website designer. Yes. These oh, days cool. we have our own web designer, which is wonderful because we have so much Ooh. extremely specialized needs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as for the, the current division of labor, we've got three folks in the studio doing a lot of the sewing and manufacturing. And we are mostly at home due to various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and are uh yeah running the business side marketing customer service and, the and shipping, department. shipping and, and we're the, the shipping, shipping department <laughs> you're the yep. shipping department too so you drive the vehicle around you have a truck or a car no i put things in a bag and i <laughs> eli hauls them off to the post office or to the the mail room <laughs> that sounds like a plan it seems like you evolved into a very efficient yeah. So let's switch, if we may, to um, your relationship. I see your, um, you have a complete family there with you. Um, how, um, how did you have to, to expand it from the two of you? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Sure. How did you have to decide to expand your family from two to three? Yeah, I think we've been, we've been talking about having kids for a while and it was sort of a matter of being in a space where we felt comfortable and also uh you know the 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 biological factor for figuring that out <laughs> it was about yeah I would say it was one part financial stability one part location stability that we figured we really like it here in Brattleboro and we're going to stay for the long haul. And yeah, one part uh, biological availability. We had to figure that that piece of the puzzle out, but we got there. Well, one of the reasons I moved to Vermont was health care um, because it was easier to get health care. You know, so many people stay in nine to five jobs because they don't want to lose their health care. So I was able to take the leap and move here. Um, how did you find the health care as you, during your pregnancy here in Vermont? I mean, that's, you mentioned that as kind of a challenge in one of your- Yeah, projects. I had a, a really lovely experience with with some personal health care with a specific- Local health care. Local health care with specifically the queer midwife scene here in Brattleboro, ACEs. Yeah, Wonderful. they just sent Nico a birthday card. Yeah, <laughs> his first birthday is coming up. And just having home visits from, from midwives who got it and knew what was going on was great and fantastic. Yeah, and they could like sort of uh, suggest places to go and like, you know, well, this place is, is generally good as long as you, you know, explain to them exactly who you are and what's going on. <laughs> Get a sonogram here, wear your pronoun pin, it'll be fine. <laughs> On a systemic level, uh, it was not so great. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and I logged, according to my spreadsheet, 58 hours of call time over the last three months, over the, the, over the final trimester. Uh, you can imagine I was not as patient with them as I might have otherwise been. Mm -hmm. But to be fair, I was facing a complete denial of all of my health insurance. Why are you getting all of these pregnancy tests done? <laughs> In the final weeks of a pregnancy, oh. it was an entire epic. I got Vermont legal, legal aid involved. Which that was, that was a game changer. Bless them. Yeah. Was it Vermont Legal Aid? Vermont Legal Aid has an Office of Healthcare Advocacy, and they assigned me a rep to just sit on hold with Blue Cross and Vermont Health Connect for a while to get everyone on the same conference call to figure the crap out. 
And eventually it all got sorted, but uh, Blue Cross still hasn't reimbursed me for midwife care that they said they would. So, you know, it's Nico's gonna be a year old in two weeks. It's kind of been a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I've had trouble too here in Vermont, more than I expected yeah. because it's healthcare utopia for LGBT folks. So, but you, uh, you were able to try on for uh, those here with us. I was also remarkably lucky as in that I was able to have a home birth with midwives. I did not need to go to the hospital. I didn't need to deal with anybody I didn't know, which that's luck. Yeah. <laughs> and so besides that, your time in Vermont has been good. You're happy to be here? Love it. We landed here and promptly joined up with Out in the Open and haven't looked back. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Well, you tell an anecdote about um, sort of the culture shock, and it reminded me, I moved here from New Orleans, and I went to, back in the snail mail days, I went to mail a letter, and I pulled up next to a mailbox, and a policeman came over, and I thought, oh, God, he's going to give me a ticket, he's going to tell me to move, and he took my letter and mailed it. <laughs> I thought, this is, this is a new scene. <laughs> <laughs> When we were when we were still coming up to visit for summers, um, because Eli's grandfather has a house in Townsend. Uh, it's all yeah. Eli's father's now. Um, uh, we got pulled over for a speeding ticket, which was fully valid. I was absolutely speeding. Um, you know, it's that 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 part where you come off of the highway and into town. Um, and he, after we finished up, he apologized. <laughs> for taking up our time. <laughs> I know it is like us here or Mayberry or something. <laughs> and like, we didn't have to, we didn't have to go to the, the court or anything because we weren't disputing it, but we did, we did mail the ticket with the payment a little bit late, but nobody cared. <laughs> I know, I know, it's amazing. It's a very different <laughs> uh, experience to New Jersey. I know, and other businesses, you know, they expect you to pay right there. And, you know, people say, oh, I'll take a check. Oh, if you don't have your checkbook, just give it to me later. I mean, you know, for artwork that we purchased. The first sewing machine that I purchased in this town. <laughs> I went to a fabric store in, on Main Street, Brattleboro, and asked, where do I find a sewing machine? Where can I buy one? And the proprietor looked at me and said, I got three in the back. Let me pull them out. And I looked at one and said, I would really, I think I would probably really like this one. And she said, well, take it for two weeks and see if you like it. And then you can pay me. Didn't take I know, I know. Didn't know where we were staying. Didn't take a phone number or an email address, anything. I researched, I, I, I used it. I liked it. I researched a, a likely used price for that sewing machine. I came back prepared to make an offer. I made the offer and she looked at me and she took it down $20. I think it was even more than $20, but yeah. I know, incredible, incredible. It was amazing. Um, do you still get orders? Um, I know you have a background in anime and cosplay, et cetera. <laughs> do, do people order costumes from you? Is that people order costumes? costumes? Yes, I'm going to get, a, I'm going to grab a couple things for the baby. If you don't mind me pausing for about, 30 seconds for this one. We can talk, Krista. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, you're originally from New Jersey? Yes. And um, then you, did you ever, you moved to, you and Eli moved to Brooklyn at some point, and that's where he lived. Eli, in yeah, Eli was living in Brooklyn at the time. Um, when we met in person, Eli was living in Queens and then had moved to Brooklyn. And so I moved in with them in Brooklyn with like five other roommates. <laughs> and it was, only, it was only for a few months. So everybody was okay with it. Um, and then, yeah, so we were in Brooklyn for a couple of years. We moved back to Jersey for a year and then we moved up here. <laughs> and you were a stylist, a hairstylist in, yes. in another life. That's one thing, you know, I'm having trouble with here. In Montpelier, 
<laughs> if you want to go back to business, I'll drive to Brattleboro. <laughs> you can tell if I move inside, it's not pretty. There's a lovely color. Oh, I was thinking it looked really nice, but you know, it's the it's the difference between well, it looks objectively good and it looks the way I want it to, right? <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, big change though, no more hairstyling. That's got to have been hard too. All those hours on your feet, and you know, I used to teach, and one of my students who did it said, you know, it's you like everybody's therapist. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're hair, they tell you their whole life story. Yeah, no. Part of my problem was that the salon I was working in, it was a chain. It was in uh, the the salons in um, Penny's and Sears. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Macy's and Sears. And they don't advertise at all. Like part of the problem was that Sears and Macy's don't let them advertise outside of the little area that they're renting. But, you know, even the company itself didn't advertise. And the salon I was working in, it was... Uh, oh, I lost you there. The salon you were working at closed? Is that yeah, the one I was working at in Sears closed. Mm -hmm. um, and the one I was working at in Macy's, you know, I was new. I didn't really have a clientele or anything. And I didn't come into it having like this long held passion for doing hair. Uh, so it was hard to kind of uh, promote myself <laughs> and build a following. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, I ended up getting uh, laid off from that job just because I wasn't doing a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Or most of the work I ended up doing was at the, was as a receptionist. <laughs> I know. And sometimes it's just better to move on. That yeah. was my experience on Wall Street. Um, so back to the costumes. Do you have costume orders? That's the way when you started out, people from um, the Comic-Con world were um, ordering costumes from you? We used to go to conventions all dressed up in the costumes that we'd made and friends would then contact us and say, hey, can I do, could I, could you maybe turn me into Superboy? Can you do something like this? <laughs> the 90s Superboy with the, how many belts? 11. 11 belts. And a, cost, a costume from the 90s. Oh. Next 11 different belts. I bought the leather jacket. I need everything else. <laughs> 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 These days, it is not so much conventions, though we do get the occasional order of those coming up. Uh, more recently, we've had wrestling gear ordered for, ordered that we really like to do because it's something that is going to be is going to go through a lot of strain. So it needs to have reinforced seams and be ready to be active. Uh, it wrestling gear also means that we are working with a character that the wearer has invented themselves. And that's always fun. That's a delight every time because you get to find out new things about about this person and uh, really work with them to create the persona that they're going to go into the ring with. Most recently. Uh oh, you can't hear you. Lost you. There we go. Most recently, I had a special order to recreate a book cover for the client's <laughs> favorite book. Oh, how cool. Yeah, which was, it was, it's called Hell Followed With Us. It's by a, a, a trans dude author writing about trans dude body horror. And I had a really good time putting together this binder uh, that had a it's layer. Sort of a biblical angel on one side. <laughs> Layered seraphim wings with eyes in them. Uh -huh. And then a Is bleeding heart on the other side. Oh, cool. Is this an example of a custom project? I'd say so. Uh, I don't know. I don't specifically know if they're going to wear it as a costume or they're just going to wear it as a binder. That looks really cool. Uh, the oh. line between the two these days seems pretty thin because, you know, we all wear whatever we want. Uh, oh. But yeah, I, I really like doing things like that where uh, whoever sent in the the piece to me has like a passion for this object or this design and you, you both seem very social and like you like customer interaction so even though it's all online are you able to accomplish are you able to talk to your customers or interact with them in a way that is fun 
doing it online, like through the customer service line is a different experience um, uh -huh. than like being in person. We used to go to uh, conventions and pride. Yeah. Uh, so we'd have a, a table because part of the custom making process is that sometimes somebody gets a binder that doesn't fit them. And so they send it back to us. And if we can adjust the existing binder, then we can just adjust it and send that back. But if, you know, oh, if it's too small and they need something bigger, then we have to just remake it from the start. And so that smaller binder will go into our stock. And we usually, we used to take the stock with us to conventions um, mm -hmm. so that, you know, people could try things on and buy things there. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> like being able to talk to people in person and, uh, you know, explain to their parents for them what's going on and, and uh, <laughs> uh, give people space to like, to try out binding for the very first time because they've been kind of interested, but a little, um, I'm not sure if this is really for me. I don't want to drop $50 on something that I'm not quite sure is something that I really want. Um, yeah, customer service is, is different because, you know, most people are either, you know, they're, they're messaging you because something is wrong, right? And so you have to like be in customer service mode and be like, okay, so here's what we can do and here's our options. Or it's just kind of a neutral interaction. Mm -hmm. No more conventions for a while though, huh? Well, COVID kind of did a thing. Well, COVID was the beginning. Yeah. Yep. And also now there's baby. And it's <laughs> and we don't want the baby to get COVID either. No, no. No, we don't. Yeah. And I still have I still have fantasies now and again about an outdoor event here or there. Yeah. Uh, I would very much like to do something small down in Greenfield, Mass. There's... A little pop-up shop kind yeah. of thing, like we did at Blue Stockings. Yeah, an outdoor patio pop-up shop feels like the scale that's possible. Or maybe maybe even Burlington Pride. Again, it's outdoors. That helps a lot. Maybe. And Montpelier Pride's outdoors, too, on the Statehouse lawn. So and we've never been. Pride. Yeah. Yeah. So check yeah. that out. Yeah, just yeah, a where we can be there for a few hours mm -hmm. rather than, well, we've got to go to Philly and be at the Philadelphia Convention Center for three days. <laughs> Philadelphia Trans Health is a very, is was a great event to go to and it was wonderful. And also we can no longer sustain a four day convention with 10 hour days. Yeah. That is no longer possible <laughs> for us. It was just the two of well, this has been fun. I was going to ask you all these heavy qu questions about you know, trans rights in our time, but let's defer that cool. to another time. Unless, uh, tell us any last words you want to leave us with. Well, what would you like to say to potential customers? It's not that scary. Binding is a way to be in the world. It's a cloth it's a piece of clothing that you can choose to wear or not it's underwear it's underwear it makes sense for a lot of people and you don't have to be a specific way for it to make sense for you and also it's fine to go with cheaper binders if you're just starting out and you don't want to drop $80 on something that you're not sure you want. <laughs> if you want to drop $80 on a custom made made in Vermont binder, you can come to us. And also it's totally fine to just try we it out. We didn't do that. We understand. <laughs> you don't have to come to us. We don't, we won't be offended. I love you it. You have the money yeah, and you know you want it. <laughs> oh, oh, I do have, I do have one, I do have one more thing to say, which is if you don't want to drop $80, but you still want to come to Vermont Makers, Try out a make your own kit. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> we have a cheaper sure. option. Hey, our our sure. low cost option, which we just started doing and which I'm really excited about is that we sell kits that are the fabric and the pattern and instructions. And you get the kit and you learn how to make your own binder with your own home sewing machine. And then if you need to tailor your other binders or make a binder for a friend, you have the knowledge and the skills already. And that's something that I feel really strongly about is giving the knowledge that we've built 
out to the community and teaching other people how to make their own binders and what the fabric feels like when it works and how you can get soft fabric that that binds effectively make your own the make your own kits that we now sell are my theory for how to decentralize this knowledge and hopefully someday have a queer tailor in every community who can help out people with shapewear so that people don't have to always send their binders to us because sometimes oh, you're oh. in Australia or Tennessee or New Zealand or, or London or wherever and it's kind of hard to send everything to Vermont and back. Get a kit, develop the knowledge and the skill, become the resource that you need. <laughs> oh, all right. Sorry, we're the binder is like $80. The kits are 30. Okay, very <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> and I would add that the binders that I saw were just beautiful, beautiful thank works you. of art. So thank you. Uh, Krista and Eli, thank you for joining us and be sure to come back again. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Love to, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>